So uh, we are in Jeremiah 25, verses 15 to 38. Jeremiah 25, verses 15 to 38. Maybe I should have turned there first. Now, what we're going to see here tonight is that God promises wrathful judgment on the world. I told you it's not going to be a pretty one tonight. God promises wrathful judgment on the world. It's been over three months since we have last met together. The last time we met, we went over Jeremiah 25, 1 to 14. We looked at the difference between advancing the kingdom of God and advancing the dominion of darkness. We saw that God's people can do both. We can advance either kingdom. We saw that Canada is in the shape it is in because God's people were playing church and not working with Jesus to advance the kingdom of God. In the last three months since we went with Jesus to advance the kingdom of God with Lifehouse Connection, we have now seen 42 salvations. We have started 26 house churches in seven different countries on three different continents. And we now have a children's ministry going. This should be normal for the church. But God's people aren't expanding God's kingdom. And there's no gray zone. We are either expanding one kingdom or the other. And the main point tonight is that God has an indictment on the church. Melissa, can you read uh, Jeremiah 25, 15, please? Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. Thank you. What is the title of God used here? The God of Israel? The Lord? The Lord, the God of Israel. Okay. What did the God of Israel tell Jeremiah to do? Take this cup of wine of wrath and make all the nations drink it. Make all the... That's right. This is not going to be a fun assignment. What was Jeremiah to do with the cup? And? Cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. Make them drink my wrath. Jeremiah 25, 16, please, Stacy. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So what will these nations do? They will drink it and stagger and be crazed. Yeah, they're going to become crazy <clears throat> off of this. Why will this happen when they drink of the cup of God's wine of wrath, according to that verse? Say that again? Why will this happen to them when they drink of this cup, according to verse 16? of the sword that that I am sending among them so God's saying 
I'm sending a sword, meaning I'm going to come kill you. Ivan, can you read Jeremiah 25, 17, please? So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it. Okay. What did Jeremiah do? And made nations drink it. Okay, Jane, twenty-five, eighteen. Jerusalem and the towns of Judea, his kings and officials, to make them a ruin, and the object of horror and scorn, and cursing as they are today. Who did God send Jeremiah to first? To Jerusalem, the cities in Judah, with their kings and officials. What was God going to make them? Desolation. A desolation and a waste. And a, waste and a, curse, a, a, a hissing and a curse. Okay. Why do you think God is sending his wrath to his people first? Better, do better. You're right. His people were expanding the dominion of darkness throughout the world by living disobediently to the Mosaic Covenant. Because they walked in disobedience, they stopped being the light of the world and allowed Satan's kingdom to take over. Ray, can you read 1 Peter 4.17, please? First Peter 4.17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So is Peter speaking to Israel or the church? The church. The church. It's sounding very similar to what God's speaking to Israel, though, isn't it? This is now the church. Where does judgment start? It begins at the house of God. Hmm. Begins with us. We're the house of God. We're the house of God. Judgment begins here. Let me be clear. There, there's a, a theological term. You don't need to know the term. It's called immutable. I'll tell you what it means. This this simple. When someone says that God is immutable, it means God never changes. If God's going to do this to his people in the Old Testament, God's going to do this to his people in the New Testament. God doesn't change. Greg, can you read 1 Peter 2 9, please? First Peter 2 9. Peter 2.9? Yes. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, 
that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of the darkness into this wonderful light. So according to 1 Peter 2.9, what four things are we? A holy nation. A chosen people first, priesthood. yeah. Royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Holy nation. The people for his own possession. Now, according to 1 Peter 2.9, why are we these four things to God? Say that a little louder. That you may proclaim the excellence of him. Okay. To proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what is Peter saying that we proclaim? The gospel. 100%. We are God's people for one reason. To preach the gospel. If we focus on being chosen, but we are not sharing the gospel, it shows we are not chosen and still under the wrath of God. There are too many quote-unquote Christians who practice what I call Christian Gnosticism. Um, Gnostics. Paul fights against the Gnostics in one of his epistles. And the Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C, Gnostic, meant that you were saved by a secret knowledge. If you had the right learning, if you had the right knowledge, you're saved. There are too many quote-unquote Christians who practice Christian Gnosticism. Number one, this is the first part of it. I am saved because I am chosen, is what they say. Does it sound like Calvinist? Oh, we'll call it hyper Calvinists. <clears throat> Number two, the more intellectual I become, the more spiritual I am. Number three. I don't need to share the gospel because God has already chosen who will be saved. <laughs> Number four. Knowing intricate doctrine is more important than sharing the gospel. What will happen to Christians who think this way, according to what we've read in Jeremiah and in 1 Peter? They have the wrath of God. You got it. They will receive the wrath of God. So, technically, maybe they aren't really saved. 100%. 100%. Whose turn is it? Well, Lisa, can you read Exodus 19.6, please? You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Oh, what was Israel to be? Kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A king? Well, doesn't that sound familiar? 
Oh, from what we've studied throughout Jeremiah was is, like, our whole year last year. Was Israel acting like a kingdom of priests? No. Was God angry about this? Mm -hmm. Yes. They kept giving them chances. Kept giving them chances. Were they serving God? No. no. What were they serving? Themselves. Themselves and the Baals. But you're right. When you're serving Baals, you're really serving yourself. Does the North American church serve the Baals? Mm -hmm. Some do. I put down no. Like, we don't bow down to the golden cow, things like well, that. They don't make it obvious. They don't make it obvious. <laughs> yeah. But generally speaking... The Olympics made it obvious. The Olympics made it very obvious. Generally speaking, is the church in North America engaged in the Great Commission? No. Generally speaking, is the church therefore serving God? No. Mm. So if the church is not serving the Baals and not serving God, who is the church serving? Themselves. Themselves. So if we are serving ourselves in a worship service... Do we look like Jesus or Satan? That, hey, if you can't say amen, you got to say ouch. We have to steal. 100%. The only church where Jesus was not inside. Okay. You know, sometimes, sometimes I shouldn't say this because it's got fat on it. But, um, at, at Do you want me to pause it? Who listens to it from our church? A lot. Oh, pause it. <laughs> Jeremiah 25, 19-26. Actually, I'll read that one because there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different countries in there and nations. So I'll read that one. And then Stacy, you can read after me, okay? Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his officials. Uh, all his people and all the mixed tribes among them, all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, Moab, and the sons of Ammon, all the kings of Tyre, all the kings of Sidon, and the kings of the coastland across the sea, Dedan, Tema, Buz, and all uh, and all who cut the corners of their hair, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed tribes who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, and all the kings of, of Medea, all the kings of the north, far and near, one after another, and all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth. And after them, the king of Babylon shall drink. You may not know the geography of all these nations. But when you map them out, they are in concentric circles expanding from Jerusalem. It's like a Doppler ring. You drop a rock in the water and the rings go out. Did Judah's disobedience to God regarding being a kingdom of priests negatively affect these surrounding nations? Yes. It sure did. Are people in our area of influence going to drink the cup of God's wrath because we did not obey God? That's a little bit of a trick question. Absolutely. Okay. The people in in our area 
in our sphere of influence. It all depends what other influences are coming in and out. Okay. This is what I wrote down. People are responsible for, the, for their own sin. We all deserve the wrath of God. Okay. However, we have a duty as a royal priesthood to share the light of Christ in the darkness through gospel proclamation. By not going, we are guaranteeing their destruction. What was the last nation to drink the cup of God's wrath? Babylon. Babylon. What is the original name of Babylon in the Bible? Do you guys know? Egypt? No. Babel. Babel. You got it. Babel. What was founded at Babel? The Tower of Babel. Now... Let's think about this here. Then we're going to will it down because it just wasn't a tower. It was something deeper than that. Bigger than God. Which means? You're worshiping yourself. Now this is the very beginning of man-made religion. The beginning of man-made religion. Wasn't that also where they... Started speaking different languages. Yeah. Genesis or whatever. Yeah. So, like, when they're all worshiping Baal and Moloch and all of the, that's not man made, that's Satan made them. Okay. I want to talk about something. This is. Uh, this is something I've been meditating on for a few days. No, it'll, it'll help. It'll help. When Adam and Eve sinned, before Adam and Eve sinned, who had dominion over the earth? Adam. Adam did. Okay. Who went? To Eve. The snake. Satan did. What clothes were Adam and Eve wearing? Nothing. Okay, keep that in the back of your mind. Who, outside of God, now, saw Adam's nakedness. Satan. Satan did. Who did the snake go to? Eve. The woman. <clears throat> God destroys the earth. Okay, so now, what? before we get to destruction of the earth, who ends up getting who ends up getting the dominion now? Jesus. Satan does. Okay. So God destroys the earth. And only eight people are saved. Noah and Mrs. Noah. Okay. <laughs> Shem and Mrs. Shem. Ham and Mrs. Ham. And Japheth and Mrs. Japheth. That's it. Now Noah, after the flood, plants a vineyard. Do you see a tree in the garden? And now we see a tree with Noah. He makes wine. He gets drunk. Ham. Uh oh. What did Ham do? No. 
of his brothers. Uncovered his father's nakedness. You know what that means? He raped his mother. And you might think, ooh, horrible, horrible. Ham did? Ham did. Okay, because it's too dirty for church. We talked about it here in the Bible study. Yeah. Now, a years ago. now, why? Why would a son with the only family in the world, okay, so if this is, this is the only family in the world, so what does that make Noah? King Noah. So what did Ham do? He's trying to take over the dominion of Noah by sleeping with Noah's wife. Reuben did the same thing in Genesis. This is a power play. And in the blessings, when, okay, Ham doesn't get a blessing or a curse. But he impregnated his mother. And mom bears Canaan and says, Cursed be Canaan. And out from Canaan comes Nimrod. The first Antichrist. The guy that built the tower. The guy that built the tower. So now, the question is, man-made religion. Where did it come from? Man or Satan? And the answer now is, yes. Both. Both. You see that now? Do you see that connection now? Okay. Who's turning? Stacy, Jeremiah. Don't uh, no no no. That's not it. What was founded at Babel? Man-made religion. What is the last thing God is going to pour His wrath on? You guys remember from Revelation? Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. What is the last thing God's going to pour His wrath on? Man-made religion going to destroy it. And that's why Babylon is the last one listed in this list. Uh, Stacy, Jeremiah 25, 27, please. Then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink, be drunk, and vomit. Shall fall, <laughs> fall and rise no more. Because of the sword that I am sending among among you. Okay, so what is God sending among all these nations when they drink the cup of his wrath? What is he sending them? Yeah, what's the he sword. The sword, which means utter destruction. Uh Ivan Jeremiah twenty five twenty eight, please. But if they refuse to take the cup from your hand and drink, tell them, this is what the Lord Almighty says. You must drink it. Okay. What was Jeremiah to say to the nations if they refused to drink the cup of God's wrath? God says you have to do this. You have to do it. Jane twenty five twenty nine, please. I see I am beginning to bring disaster on the city that bears my name. And will you indeed go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, for I am calling down a sword upon all who live on the earth, declares the Lord Almighty. Okay, so mine says, for behold, 
What does behold mean? Pay attention. Pay attention. Look intently on this. Where is God going to begin to work disaster? Oh. In Jerusalem. <laughs> what question does he ask the nations? Yeah, let me put it in the Jason translation. If I'm not going to spare my people, do you think I'm going to spare you? Who is God summoning a sword against? All the earth on earth. All the inhabitants of the earth. He's coming for everyone. You asked me about your brother in that dream, and what did I tell you? He's going to hell. That's what that dream is saying. Well, what does that mean, sir? He's going to die soon? Sooner or later, he's going to die. Sooner or later, we all die. That's right. But wouldn't it be better off if he died saved? Uh, Ray, I'm going to have you go back to 1 Peter 4, 17 and 18. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not be the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one can scarce be saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? So, where does judgment begin? Household of God. In the household of God. What does scarcely mean? Rarely. Pardon me? Rarely. Rarely, or hardly, or barely, or almost? If the righteous are scarcely saved? Like, guys, we got to take this seriously. Will the outcome be better or worse for the ungodly and the sinner? It's going to be worse. The ones that don't even know God's righteous decree, they at least have their consciences. And if God's willing to do this to Jerusalem, according to Peter, he's willing to do it to the church. Well, Jason, what about once saved, always saved? That is a true doctrine. But it is a crap doctrine. Let me explain. The doctrine of eternal security is two doctrines put together to form one. I want you to think about it like the color green. Is green a primary color? No, it's not. Yellow and, blue. Yellow and blue. You need to put the two together to get green. Okay. That's the doctrine of eternal security. The first doctrine, the yellow, is the doctrine of effectual calling. Your life will be so radically changed by the gospel, Jesus will so radically change your life that it will be evident to everyone. Like if one of my guys showed up to work an hour late and said, boss, I'm sorry I'm late, as he's holding a tall Starbucks and he's looking fine, 
And he says, I was hit by a semi-truck on the way to work. Am I going to believe him? No. Why? Because a semi-truck would kind of change him a little bit. He'd look a little different. Is God bigger than a semi-truck? Number one, the yellow is the doctrine of the of effectual calling. Number two, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. 1 John 2.2 2. Those who left us were never of us from the beginning. doesn't mean you don't leave one church for another. It means to totally walk away from the faith. Now you have your green. And for the last hundred or so years, the church has been saying, if, if you want to be saved, just close your eyes and put up your hand. I share the gospel at the end of every sermon. Have you guys heard that? You have. What do I say about saying Jesus is Lord? I stop and I say, let's talk about this. Because Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And when I get to that point and I'm sharing the gospel with somebody and I say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, stop here. Let's talk about what Lord means. Who do you pay your rent to? The landlord. Why do you call him the landlord? Because he owns the property. So if I'm calling Jesus Lord, what am I calling him? My owner. So what do you call a person who is owned by another person? A slave. Does a slave have any rights? No. No. And you might be thinking, I don't, I'm a free person. I don't want to be a slave. Well, good news here, Je uh, here, genius. You're already a slave to two things. You're a slave to sin. Like how many of you are saying, I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. I don't want to sin. And you end up sinning. And number two, you're a slave to Satan. Slavery to sin and Satan will get you hell. Slavery to Jesus will get you eternal life. To be a slave, you do what he says. Will the outcome be better or worse for the ungodly and the sinner? And we said it's going to be worse. Is Peter getting this from Jeremiah regarding the church. Where is he getting it from? Is he just coming up out of thin air? No. He's getting it from Jeremiah. Why? Because God never changes. Jeremiah 25, 30, please, Greg. All the kings of Zemariah, Elam, Media, and all the kings of the north, near and far, one what, after another. What, 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 what verse are you in? Jeremiah? 25, 30. 3, 0. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, 3, 0. Now prophesize all these words against them and say to them, The Lord will roar from on high. He will thunder from his holy dwelling and roar mightily against his land. He will shout like those who tread the grapes, shout against all who live on the earth. Thank you. Who is God roaring against? His fold. His fold. 
Like, I, I've never had a lion roar at me. I've never been that close, but I'll tell you what. I've been to a buffalo ranch before, and they don't need to be that close to you, and they grunt, and you feel it in your chest. How much worse a lion? And who's a lion roaring at? His fold. Mm -hmm. He's mad. What is he going to shout like? Those who fed the grapes. He stole the inhabitants of the earth. Okay. Guess what? Treading the grapes? That's a Hebrew idiom for the wrath of God. At the same time, in the wine press, treading the, the grapes is a joyous time. He's going to enjoy this. And we are not. That's right. Because God's wrath needs to be satisfied. Because his justice needs to be satisfied. Who else is going to roar? Well, who else is he going to roar against? All the inhabitants of the earth. So he starts with us. He starts with us. And then he goes to the world. Jeremiah 25, 31, please, Melissa. The clamor will resound to the ends of the earth, for the Lord has has an indictment against the nations. He is entering into judgment with all flesh, and the wicked he will put to the sword, declares the Lord. Where will the clamor go to? The ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth. What has gone to the ends of the earth? The wickedness. The Lord's indictment. The Lord's indictment started in Jerusalem. The Lord's indictment starts in the church, and then it goes out to the ends of the earth. Remember, this is like Doppler rings. Consensual, uh, con, con, you know, do, those, those rings that go out from consent. What was it? Concentric, not consensual. Concentric <laughs> rings. Who is he entering into judgment with? All flesh. All flesh. It starts with the church, then goes to the world. Who will he put to the sword? The wicked. The wicked. Jeremiah 25, 32, please. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, disaster is going forth. From nation to nation, and a great tempest is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth. Okay. What is the name of God here? Lord. Lord of hosts. What does that mean? Do you guys remember? The Lord of angel armies. Now God's army is against you. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Pretty bad. Where is disaster going? From nation to nation. What is stirring from the farthest parts of the earth? A great tempest. Now what is a tempest? It says a great whirlwind. A good, I'm glad it does. A strong whirlwind. We were living just outside of Edmonton in 1987. Oh. <laughs> it was July, July 31st, 1987. My father was a superintendent on the expansion for the Mesocordia Hospital on the west side of Edmonton. The tower crane operator got out of the crane as fast as he could. 
and told everyone to run for cover. That day is known in Edmonton as Black Friday. The tornado was a mile wide at the base and lasted over an hour. We went to help clean up a few days later. And there was nothing but complete devastation. I remember, I think uh, I was 10 years old. You were teaching, I think, is now they're a sanctuary city. Mm -hmm. Oh, are they? Well, I was 10 years old, and I remember going to the trailer park. I'm not kidding you. It looked like a dump. There was no structure left. Everything was... And 14 people died in that trailer park. Can you imagine, can you imagine a tornado on a trailer park for an hour, a mile wide? This is a metaphor of God's wrath coming on the nations. Jeremiah 25, 33, please, Ivan. At the end, or at that time, those slain by the Lord will be everywhere, from one end of the earth to the other. They will not be mourned or gathered up or buried, but will be like dung lying on the ground. Who will extend? What? Is that 33? Yeah. Who will extend from one end of the earth to the other? He was pierced by the Lord. Jane, go back one book to Isaiah, and please read Isaiah 53, 5. Those pierced by the Lord. This is our hinge verse now. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And pun the punishment that has brought us peace upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Who was pierced for our transgressions? Jesus. Jesus. So what's being said here in these two Old Testament books? We have Two options. Number one, we can be pierced by, by the Lord for our transgressions. Or number two, the Lord can be pierced for our transgressions. Your choice. Break, we're going to go back to Jeremiah 25, 33. Can you read that again, please? And at that day, the slain of the Lord shall come from one end of the earth, even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, or gathered, or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Refuse? What does yours say? Dung. Dung. Will those who are pierced by the Lord be lamented for? That means mourned over. No. Will they be buried? What shall they be? Okay, I want you to... Now, Ivan read that first, right? Mm -hmm. Ivan... His has a simile. It says, like dung. The other word-for-word -word translations doesn't use the simile. Well, mine says, but it shall be dung. No, not, not it shall be. It they shall, shall be. be. There's not a simile there, is there? No. Do you want God's calling? Those people who are pierced by the Lord? 
Lower than garbage. Worse than garbage. <laughs> <laughs> a steamy pile of it. Yeah. That's what people who are pierced by the Lord are like in God's eyes. That refuse the Lord. Well, that doesn't sound very nice, Jesus. It's not me. A life lived outside of the Lordship of Christ is nothing more than crap. And that's God saying that, not me. Jeremiah 25, 34, please, Greg. Weep and wail, you shepherds. Roll in the dust, you leaders of the flock. For your time to be slaughtered has come. You will fall and be shattered like fine pottery. Who is to wail? The shepherds of? Of the flock of Judah. Who are the shepherds of Judah? Do you guys know? <clears throat> the politicians, the priests, and the teachers are rabbis. According to Exodus 19.6, what was Israel supposed to be? A kingdom of... Priests. priests. A priest mediates between God and man. According to 1 Peter 2 9, what is the church? You guys remember what four things? A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. And a people for his own possession. Are these the same titles for Israel? Yes. Well, nowadays people would. The Old Testament Israel. <laughs> Old Testament Israel. Okay. Why do why do, does the church have these four titles? Why? You guys remember? We're supposed to stand out and bring people in and teach people. To proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His glorious light. To proclaim this means that we share the gospel. That is is the reason Christ saved us. Who are the shepherds of the church? Believers. The pastors and the elders. Let's go back to Jeremiah 25, 34. Whose turn is it? Did Greg read? Yeah. yeah read. Melissa, go ahead. 2534, read it again. Uh, Wail, you shepherds, and cry out, and roll in ashes, you lords of the flock, for the days of your slaughter and disper dispersion have come, and you shall fall like a choice vessel. What three things are the, are the <coughs> shepherds to do? Cry out, roll in ashes. And wail. And wail. Why are they to do these three these three things? The day of their slaughter is here and the dispersion has come. We're kicking you out. How will they fall? Like a choice vessel. Like a choice vessel. They will be shattered like a fine vase hitting the floor. These are the shepherds. And the leaders of the church. Mm -hmm. 
Stacy, 2535, please. No refuge will remain for the shepherds, nor escape for the lords of the flock. What will not remain for the shepherds? No refuge and no escape. Do you know what that means? There's no place to run to and there's no place to hide. God's going to get you. God's going to get you. 25, 36 to 37, please, Ivan. Hear the cry of the shepherds, the wailing of the leaders of the flock, for the Lord is destroying their pasture. The peaceful meadows will be laid waste because of the fierce anger of the Lord. What is the voice? The cry of the shepherds. Why are they crying? Lord's destroying their pasture. Lord's destroying their pasture. What will happen to the peaceful fields? They'll be laid to waste. They'll be devastated. Why are they devastated? Fierce anger of the Lord. Because of the fierce anger of the Lord. Jane, can you read 2538, please? Like a lion, he will leave his lair, and their land will become desolate because of the sword of the oppressor and because of the Lord's fierce anger. Who has... How has he left his lair? Kind of like the Lion of Judah. Jesus has left his lair. What has the land become? Desolate. A wasteland. Why has the land become uh, become a waste? Because of the sword of, of the sword and God's fierce anger is what I wrote down. Yeah. In verse 15, what was Jeremiah to take from the Lord? Take his hand. Cup take from my hand a cup that is filled with wine of my wrath. Greg? I need you to read Luke 22, 39 to 44. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 22, 39 to 44. Uh, Luke 22, verses 3, 9 to 4, 4. Jesus went out, as usual, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples he found them asleep exhausted from sorrow why are you sleeping he asked them get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation thank you to 
Four or four. Yeah, you got it. What did Jesus ask the Father to remove from him? What was Jesus sweating? Did Jesus drink the cup of the wine of God's wrath? He did. Melissa, Matthew 4.19, please. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If we are his followers... Sorry, what promise did Jesus make? That's right. So if we are his followers, the sign of being his follower is the promise. I will is a promise. Is the promise that we will be fishers of men. That's the sign we follow Jesus. Stacy Matthew 28, 18 to 20, please. <clears throat> and Jesus, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What has been given to Jesus? Command. No. All authority. All authority. All authority. In where? In heaven. Okay. What's the first thing he commands us to do? Go. Go. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations. Okay. What is this called, making disciples of all nations? What does that mean? What, what do we do? To... Sharing the gospel. Okay. Sharing the gospel. Telling people that Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath for them. That's the gospel. You don't need to have the wrath of God come on you. Jesus did it for you. What's the next thing we do? according to the Great Commission. After make disciples, what do we do? Baptize. We baptize them. What's the next thing after we baptize them? Teach them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Okay, now, let's think this out logically now. What's the first thing he commanded his disciples to do? No. Just follow him. What is the proof we are following him? We're making disciples. It's not that hard, is it? We sure like to make it hard. It's not that hard. When we obey the Great Commission... Who will always be with us? The Lord Jesus. Read Acts 1.8. Is it Ivan now? Yeah. yeah, so Acts is right after John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. I hope I'm not embarrassing Ivan here. He sends me a 
Instagram message and he goes, can I get that YouTube channel? I like to listen to your sermons when I'm driving up to work. <laughs> uh, Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness says in Jerusalem and all in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Okay. What promise does Jesus give to us to prove that we have the Holy Spirit? Power. And that, receive power. Okay, and what does that power look like? It's the Holy Spirit. Okay, but what does that power do? It uh, helps you to spread the gospel. 100%. You're going to be my witnesses now. Okay. So the promise, how do we know we have the Holy Spirit? We're preaching the gospel. We're preaching the gospel. Ray, no. Jane now. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, please. Ephesians 14. Chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Who is a despot guaranteed our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory? Are you in Ephesians 1? No. Nope. What am I in You were reading verse 14. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, start in verse 13. Oh. Start in verse 13. I'm like, part of that sounds familiar. Uh, where's 13? Wait. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believing believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the, prom the yeah. promised Holy Spirit. Keep on reading. Who is a despot guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possessions to the praises of his glory? Okay, so that's the words deposit, mm -hmm. but that's fine. No, 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 that's, that, that's fine. It's for, for people that are listening online. Okay. So who did we, who did we receive when we believed in Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do according to verse 14? Guarantee of our inheritance. He's the guarantee of our inheritance, which is our salvation. How do we know we have the Holy Spirit from what we've read today? We fish for men. We are his witnesses. We train new disciples to follow Jesus and how to look uh, uh, and how to look for the evidence of following Jesus, which is fishing for men. We are to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus, our cup drinker who called us and is calling others out of darkness into his glorious light. Isn't that something? But let me tell you something. If we do not have the evidence of being gospel proclaimers, according, this is not Jason saying it, this is scripture. Are we saved? No. no, we are not. And judgment is going to fall on who? The leaders first and then all the people. If your leaders are not training you and not encouraging you to share the gospel...
you by default are in for a bunch of hurt, eternal hurt. We have the church or Satan has worked through the leaders to lull the, lull the people into a deep sleep that if you go to church and you sing your pretty songs and you listen to the guy in the pulpit and you give your money, that's all that matters. That's all that matters. Any wonder Canada is in the state we're in? Whose fault is it? The church. Brings us to our conclusion. Number one. God has wrathful anger over sin. Number two, God is angry with a large portion of the North American church. Very angry. Number three, a large amount of the North American church are Christian Gnostics. Number four, God is going to judge the church before he judges the world. Number five, God will destroy man-made religion. Number six, God is ready to destroy many of the current pastors and elders of churches in North America. Number seven. The pastors and elders are not training their flock how to follow Jesus and how to, how to see the evidence of following Jesus. Jesus. Number eight. Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath. So we don't have to. Number nine. The evidence of following Jesus is we make disciples. Number 10. If we are not working with Jesus to expand his kingdom, we do not belong to Jesus and do not have the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our salvation.